the signal start recording, but she just has. Well, it seems like uh, Eva is keen to get us started, so we may as well start. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Dario Kenner. I work at CAFOD and we are a member of the UK Debt Coalition, along with Jubilee Debt Campaign, Christian Aid, Global Justice Now, um, who are all uh, hosting, uh, co-hosting this webinar uh, this evening. And we've been working together uh, since, uh, well, for 20 years, depends on how you want to count it, but very closely since April of 2020, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And that was really because we recognised, well, we wanted to support the work of Chile Debt Campaign, but all those other organisations, we recognised we really needed to work on debt in a concerted way. We've been trying to get debt cancelled since then, um, trying to get debt relief. It's a really crucial issue, as we'll hear uh, later on. And we've been doing that through various ways, parliamentary work, media work. We've had a particular focus on private creditors, which... Uh, will be explained why they're so important um, compared to 20 years ago when there were previous uh, calls for debt cancellation. And so from about March of last year, we were campaigning on BlackRock, uh, JP Morgan, UPS and HSBC. And that was in a, a kind of more of a general campaign to call for those private creditors to participate in debt cancellation, debt restructuring. And now this time, and that's why we've got you here today, is really focused on what's happening in Zambia, because as we'll hear from Nguazi and from Tim, Zambia is, the Zambian government is, is, uh, is in negotiations with its, with its creditors. So that's why we're, our campaign has evolved to really focus on BlackRock. Um, I won't say any more at this point. I'll invite um, Nguazi to, um, to, to say a few opening words, and then I'll ask her, uh, a few a few questions, and then also I'll do the same with Tim from Julie Debt Campaign, and then we'll have a question and answer. So um, Ngwazi is a member of the um, Zambian uh, Civil Society Debt Alliance, and uh, until recently she was the um, executive director of the Non-Governmental Gender Organizations Coordinating Council. So um, Ngwazi Mwale, please, uh, could you um, turn your camera on, if that's possible, and um, maybe just briefly introduce yourself, and then I'll ask you a first question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dario. For some reason, I'm unable to start um, a camera unless somebody helps from that end. Okay, well, uh, maybe if I can hopefully, Eva, hopefully Eva can, can figure that out, but maybe you'd just like to start by um, introducing yourself and we can, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dario. And uh, thank you very, very much for having us to be part of this um, interaction this evening. Uh, like you rightly mentioned, I'm the immediate past executive director for the NGOCC, which is a network of women's organizations in Zambia. And uh, we did hold the position of vice chairperson um, on the civil society data lands in Zambia. So yeah, we have been interacting, I think on Zambia's date for quite some time. And I think our intention under the civil society data alliance is to be able to ensure that we bring on board the voices of the communities on matters of discussing date and uh, the implications of date on the common people. And of course, at the time when I was executive director, it was also seen to be prudent to be able to ensure that we bring on board the voices of women, but also for women to discuss from their own lived experiences, the implication of Zambia's update, and especially um, at the rate where the country was uh, registering unsustainable you know, debt levels. So in short, yeah, so of course now beyond NGOCC, I still remain within the, the sector I'll be joining the financial sector, uh, one of the companies that is going to be working around financial inclusion, uh, which is still you know, very, very relevant to the desk discourse. So in short, yeah, that is me. Um, I've served in the civil society organizations for the last 17 years, uh, engaging on a lot of issues, especially around gender and development. 
And this is what brings me on the table to share with you some of the perspectives around Zambia's debt and the implication on social service delivery in Zambia. Okay, thank you so much for, for giving us um, a bit more background about, about yourself. You were talking there about the, the impact of, of debts on, on the common person in Zambia and, and particularly on women. Could you maybe give us a few examples of, 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 the, of the impacts and kind of day-to-day -day people's lives? Would that be possible? Yes, sure, sure. Um, because by and large, thank you, Dario, for that uh, important question. Because by and large, any debt that is procured by any government is meant to contribute to the well-being of its citizens. And any debt that is procured is meant to make the lives of its citizens better, you know, by way of investing that money into basic social service delivery, but also investing in um, um, sustainable development projects. And um, of course, to also ensure that any physical deficit that the, the government at that particular time is going through is met with any you know, kind of debt that is procured to simply ensure that most of the development projects that are ongoing should actually be enabled to do that. So we are coming um, from, I don't know if you allow me to just give a little background of how the Zambian debt you know, came to being. And um, I want to refer to the previous government, like you know, Dario, Zambia in 2021, we had our general elections uh, where um, the people of Zambia and the majority youth came out in numbers to actually indicate their power of the vote, you know, in terms of which government they wanted to, you know, to lead them, you know, in the next five years. And this was done on the basis that, um, there were quite a lot of discontent with the previous uh, government um, because of the nature of some of the development projects that were happening. And people felt that by and large, they had been left behind. And that was in contradiction to, you know, what Zambia is part of the sustainable development goals and the theme is leaving no one behind. But by and large, it was felt that information, especially around Zambia's date was not flowing to people to appreciate why Zambia was in a situation that we were in. And therefore, the, the, the previous regime was voted out um, you know, purely on the basis that people, the majority people were quite dissatisfied with the way the social services were being delivered, but also that Zambia was recorded as the first country to have um, reneged on its um, data repayment. Um, so I think that um, is, is one important fact that I thought I could share before we get into discussing yes. why we are where we are. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Could you just try turning your video on and then I will ask you a, a question based on what you just said. Okay, let me give it a try. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Have you now? Brilliant. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank so you. just so just um, connecting with, with what you were just saying, as 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 you explained, there were elections in Zambia last year, and a new government was voted in. And as you said, there was discontent with the um, how how debt was managed, shall we say, by the previous government, and what debt was taken on for. Is can we just talk a little bit about the the responsibility of, of the borrower, but also of the lenders. So in this case, you know, we're really talking about BlackRock and the private creditors. How, how do you see that kind of relationship and, and, and what are the important points that, to uh, highlight? So there's the, the Zambian government on the one side and which can change depending on the political party and then there's the, the lenders on the other. Uh, first and foremost, I think that's also very, very important. Um, you know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that um, at the moment uh, where we are right now as a country, our debt has actually put a strain on our national budget. We have uh, physical um, differences, as, 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 we, as, as we may know, 
in terms of um, where government is actually spending much more, almost 50% of its budget on paying uh, for debt repayment. And as a result, spending on critical social sectors has actually shrunk, whereby giving examples of the health sector, with the, with the onset of the COVID-19, we saw that our health sector was ill-prepared you know, to deal with the pandemic, in that most of our health facilities were quite short on important health accessories and equipment and, 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 and also drugs. So this is the reason why one of the things that uh, we've saw during the COVID-19 is that uh, many of our um, health facilities were actually under strain because of the inadequate allocation of resources to deal with the health requirements. For example, Zambia is, um, Zambia is party to um, you know, the commitment of ensuring that 15% of the national budget, for example, goes to the health sector. But uh, continuously since 2012, we've seen um, allocation around only 8%, 8 to 9%, which has not been adequate to be able to deal with the demand you know, on to the health sector. Uh, also, for example, the education sector, many of the rural health, um, the rural education facilities still needed to be attended to, especially the secondary schools. We have um, quite a number of primary schools, quite all right, that are um, servicing most of our communities. But in the areas, for example, where NGOCC, the organization I was working with, where we operate, we find that secondary schools were quite so distant, you know, from the communities, from where the communities were, or because there was, there was not enough funding to ensure that secondary schools were built and completed. I can give one example of a secondary school in the northern part of Zambia, where we were implementing ending child marriage project. We had quite a lot of girls that came out from marriages and wanting to go back to school, most of them to go to secondary education. But the only secondary education and school that was being built, this is uh, almost seven years down the line, is not complete because government has failed to provide adequate resources, you know, to be able to complete that, 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 that secondary school. And this, that situation is actually the same in most of the areas. So instead we have quite a lot of learners that are completing primary education, but they're having difficulties in actually getting to secondary education or because most of our resources are actually being channeled towards debt repayment. And then thirdly, when it comes to social protection, Zambia is one of those countries that um, is a youth kind of population, More, almost 70% of our population is youth. Even the time when the government was actually receiving or procuring most of the loans, it was found that most of this funding was actually going to the roads, to the bridges, without a corresponding investment into production and manufacturing. At the same time when the debt was actually increasing for Zambia, the unemployment levels were also going up. So meaning that there was a disjoint between the, the debt and to where it was being proportioned, as well as ensuring that there was a shift in terms of economic activities around um, making sure that there was economic growth that could be able to ensure that it included the majority of the population you know, around uh, the economic activities. So because there was no corresponding investment in manufacturing and production, and there was high rate of unemployment, we saw quite a lot of youth and women getting into the informal sector. And we know that in the informal sector, there's no job security, there is no you know, uh, kind of um, um, investment, sustainable investment that people can actually engage on. So the, the repercussion of the high debt you know, for the country is actually being felt much more by the ordinary people, especially the women and youth that are mostly finding themselves in the informal sector because there are no formal jobs and our entrepreneurial environment is not growing because be before then, before the new government came into being, we saw that government went into a kind of expenditure, massive expenditure, so to say, on infrastructure and coupled with expanding size of the budget, which widened the fiscal deficit. 
So the country had to increase borrowing to finance the deficit at the same time without corresponding growth in terms of uh, economic activities. So and I think this is where people felt discontent and you can attribute this to the kind of voting that was done last year with the previous government because a lot of youth and women felt disadvantaged and felt that they were being left out you know, in terms of the economic opportunities that were not being created at the same time when Zambia was actually getting into unsustainable debt levels. Okay, thank you so much for, for giving that, uh, that really rich detail because I think sometimes when we're working on, on debt justice, um, I mean, often, you know, we're, for example, campaigning on, on BlackRock, and I'd love to ask you about them and about prior creditors. But like you say, this how budgets are allocated in, in, in Zambia, how money was used, yeah. that wasn't used in ways that, 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 that could have benefited more people or particularly the, the poorest is, is, is a really vital uh, nuance. So, but, but just, just coming to the lenders now, and particularly private creditors that lend at very high interest rates, whether it's um, bondholders, Zambia has several euro bonds or it's um, direct loans. Do, do you have anything to say about about uh, their behavior, uh, particularly given that Zambia has, has defaulted, it's trying to restructure its debts, it's trying to meet these private creditors, trying to negotiate with them. Do you have anything to say about, about their role? And, and particularly this is asset managers, uh, banks, hedge funds, often based in a country like the UK. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I think we are coming from a basis that um, for those that were lending Zambia at the time, um, you know, for the ordinary people, we felt by and large that um, the ordinary citizens were let down because I think there were clear indications that um, there were serious accountability issues. There was serious information blackout in terms of engaging the ordinary citizens on where the, the loans should be applied. And there was also some kind of uh, serious um, gap because we had expected that our lenders were going to take a keen interest into some of the accountability aspects. You know, at the time before last year, um, the, the, the levels of uh, financial misapplication, uh, misappropriation, which you know, was uh, being reported in the Auditor General's reports. It was our expectation, and I want to believe the expectation of the ordinary people out there, that for those lenders that were lending Zambia, you know, funds at very exorbitant interest rates, they needed to have um, looked at some of the fundamental economic issues that especially the information that was being churned out from the Auditor General's reports. So we feel as a people let down by you know, the fact that um, the debt situation went overboard in worsening the country's economic outcomes. And um, our lenders seemingly did not have the aspirations of the ordinary citizens who now are feeling the impact of debt service payments that government has to do. And those that were vulnerable are more vulnerable. And then with the onset of the COVID-19, which worsened the situation for the country. And we saw that mostly the ones that were impacted were those in the informal sector. The partial lockdown, for example, impacted on the, on the youth and women who are the majority in population and who are supposed to be the productive age groups. Those were impacted more. And then we still saw that you know, our lenders were still bent on receiving what was due to them without really looking at how the citizens were impacted. Because at the end of the day, any lender that has, um, has a, you know, regard for life would be able to look at what is happening. Because Zambia is one of those African countries that had challenges even to be to access the vaccines for COVID. And even now, when you look at the vaccination rates for Zambia compared to countries like the UK, we are far away below I think we are far away below 20 to 30%, which really any lender should be able to sit back and say, how can they help the people of Zambia to be able to regain their, you know, their, their, their economic trajectory, to be able to regain their position as a country? Because we are coming from a previous government 
that took advantage because the law did not really uh, coerce the government to get back to the people before borrowing. So we found we saw a government that disregarded, you know, people's responsibility or people's voice in how to be able to get the debt that would ultimately contribute to people's well-being and improve their living standards or even improve the economic fundamentals. So it is on this basis that as a civil society, debt alliance, we are appealing to all those lenders really that have a heart for Zambia, that would really want to see Zambia attain, you know, good economic development levels, especially given the opportunity of the new government, because the new Don government has shown that they want to take development to the people. So far, from the budget that was announced for 2022 budget, there are quite uh, progressive, you know, pronouncements that have been included that would, you know, are pointing to inclusive economic development. And already we've seen the practicalities that the new Don government has come with in terms of ensuring that there's physical decentralization. You know, physical decentralization is now giving more, more opportunities and voice to the communities for them to determine the development agenda. It is on this score that we would want to appeal to lenders like, like BlackRock to consider providing that space and the opportunity for the new government to be able to ensure that for once they put people at the center of development and for once they can also consider uh, you know cancelling the debt to be able to provide zambia a clean slate you know to begin to you know from where to spring from in terms of churning out development because i think people are quite committed they still hope that the new Don government is providing a direction where everyone will be a part of it. We have seen the local councils being given their rightful responsibility, you know, around local basic social services. We have seen, um, you know, the, the constituent development funding, for example, being increased from 1 billion to 25, which is really very substantial increase. And that those resources are going in the hands of the people. So it is on that basis that the lenders really that are looking at Zambia's economic trajectory can be able to consider, you know, canceling the date so that then people can begin to take center stage in, in designing a kind of development program that would benefit ultimately the people of Zambia. It will really be quite beneficial and it will really also help the current government to, to maintain their commitment in terms of ensuring that inclusive economic development is actually achieved. Okay, thank you. I think, I think you very eloquently explained the uh, responsibility of, of lenders. I'm going to turn to Tim Jones now of, of Jubilee Debt Campaign. If you could put your camera on. So we've, we've we've just been hearing about uh, the the impact of of debt on uh, on the Zambian people, particularly on uh, women. Uh, we've heard about how there is a there is a new government uh, that um, has uh, plans to to increase social spending, uh, and we've also heard about the private creditors um, and what um, and kind of their role in this in in terms of lending at very high interest rates. Tim, why is it so difficult, given that there is a pandemic, it's unprecedented, um, this is, there's, there's a strong moral, obviously, moral case uh, for, for debts to be cancelled at, at this time. Why is it so difficult to get uh, a company like BlackRock to actually cancel debt? Thank you, Dario, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, so at the start of the pandemic, the <clears throat> self-appointed most important countries in the world, the G20, agreed a scheme to suspend um, debt payments. So there were around 70 countries eligible for it to apply for this debt suspension. And it said that um, all their payments um, that leave the country um, could be paused um, while the pandemic was happening. And it was payments to other governments like China, um, but they also said that private lenders should take part in this, um, companies like BlackRock. And um, the governments like China did it and the private creditors refused. The Zambian government even explicitly asked to um, suspend their payments to private lenders and the private lenders turned them down. 
And so um, those lenders across um, many countries carried on being paid. Our calculations are that um, of the countries which applied for the debt suspension, they got less than a quarter of their debt payments suspended. And that was all from um, governments and none from the private lenders. So effectively, those private companies were being bailed out. They were keeping on being paid um, during the pandemic because um, other um, the lenders like these governments um, suspended payments. So um, since um, then, and later on, um, at the end of 2020, the G20 then created a new scheme for actually um, what they call restructuring debts to take place. A debt restructuring just means something that changes the terms of the debt. So it could mean all of the debt being cancelled. It could mean just some of the interest being reduced or anything in between. And um, that scheme um, began at the end of 2020. And Zambia was one of three countries at the start of 2021 which applied for the scheme. And they've not had any debt restructured yet, none of the three countries. And in all of the cases, the private um, lenders, again, have been refusing to um, cancel restructured debt. In Zambia's case, BlackRock is the largest holder of the main chunk of debt to private lenders called bonds. So they're the largest owner of um, those that we know of. And so um, that's why we're focusing on them and calling on them to cancel the debt. OK, um, so you've, you've made it pretty clear private creditors don't really want to do anything. <laughs> Um, otherwise known as uh, getting away with it. So what what can we do as civil society? I'll also ask you in a second, Gwazi, the same question, because obviously we can do things together. What can we do as civil society in the UK, Tim, to really uh, pressure to try and transform this situation so that Zambia that is in negotiations with, it, with, with its creditors, including BlackRock, can try and get some of the debt cancelled as much as possible? Yeah, so um, at the moment is a really crucial period. So the um, Zambian government is about to start direct negotiations with its creditors. So we want those creditors, and I say BlackRock is the um, most important one on the private um, lender's side. We need them to know that we're watching and we're calling on them and we're demanding them to take action. So um, you said at the the start there's a clear moral case why um, Zambia should not have to pay the debt to BlackRock. We need BlackRock to actually hear that moral case because um, they work in a world where they're just looking for getting the highest financial return. And to give you some sense of the injustice of what that return um, could be, when these bonds, these loans were given, um, um, about six, seven years ago, the interest rate on them is 8% on average. That's at the same time as a government like the UK or the US was borrowing at zero or 1% interest rate. And the reason for that huge difference supposedly is because um, BlackRock and lenders like them say, there's a risk we might not get repaid if we lend to Zambia. So therefore we charge a high interest rate. It's actually that high interest rate that creates the risk that they don't get repaid. Um, but having lent at a high interest rate, we've then had a global pandemic. So you'd say that risk has happened. So you shouldn't get repaid because you that was why you said you needed the high interest rate. Um, even more than that, actually, I'm kind of, um, and misleading when I say BlackRock was the lender. BlackRock never lent any of the money originally. So it's other, so banks um, have kind of lent the money and then sell the debts on. And these debts get traded on financial markets every day. So people buy and sell them. And since the start of the pandemic, Zambia's bonds have um, been trading at less than 60 cents on the dollar. So that means you can buy $100 worth of debt for less than 60 cents for $60. And we know that BlackRock has bought um, a majority of the debt it owns from Zambia since late 2020. So since Zambia um, asked to suspend debts and things. So BlackRock has both got high interest rates on these debts and has bought them cheaply, which means that they could make massive profits if they were repaid this debt in full. So we need to make the moral case as to why BlackRock should not be being paid this debt during the pandemic, but 
also the immoral case of making a massive profit um, out of this crisis, which is what they're seeking to do at the moment. Okay, thank you, Tim. And um, maybe we can touch on a bit later the, the importance of that moral case that was made uh, around 20 years ago uh, when Jubilee Debt Campaign was set up and uh, which was really used very forcefully, particularly by uh, faith groups and non-faith groups um, to really um, pressure for debt to be cancelled and actually quite a lot of it was. But maybe we can touch on that in a second. I just want to ask Nguazi, the same the same question. What what are Zambian civil society doing to to pressure the Zambian government um, or to support the Zambian government uh, in 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 the in this situation where it's negotiating with its with its creditors? Well, thank you so much, um, um, and I want to agree more with what uh, Tim has said. Um, the reason why we came together as civil society and that was first and foremost to mobilize the around the, the, the discussion and narrative of debt. Because I think in many situations, a lot of people could not really relate the implication of debt on their day-to-day -day lives. So as civil society that interact with the communities, as well as interacting with our policymakers, we are coming on board to provide information to the communities so that then we can create a critical mass that would hold our government to account in terms of what needs to be done. Then secondly, we are collaborating with various other partners, the Jubilee Date Campaign, you know, others in Africa, Afrodad, and, and many of the other organizations where we are exchanging information. We are sharing pertinent information on what is happening to Zambia's debt vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, the behavior of the creditors and what kind of credit creditors um, structure we have, like Tim has mentioned. So we are able to analyze you know, the, the, the different types of data that Zambia got into, but also we are working around influencing the particular policy and legal environment, because we know that the previous regime took advantage of the lapses of the loopholes in the law by the way they were actually procuring data on behalf of a citizen. So we are also engaging and calling upon government to come up with a robust policy and legal environment that would be able to get to hold government to account before any debt is procured, let the people's representatives be able to sanction that debt. So we are working around uh, legal and policy reform as well. But also, fourthly, we are engaging. I mean, the good thing is we have a new government in, in office that is really having an open door policy. We are engaging through the Minister of Finance for us to be able to get the needed information, you know, so that even as we are meeting with different partners and if we have opportunities like this one, where we'll be appealing to some of the commercial, you know, creditors to be able to look at some of the moral aspects of you know how they can treat Zambia when it comes to the issues of interest rates like Tim has mentioned. So we are getting information from the government. We are also engaging on you know on a kind of regular basis to understand what the government plans are. Or recently as a civil society data alliance, we analyzed the economic recovery program that was put together by the previous regime. And so we are asking the right questions to the current government as to how they are intending to take the economic recovery program and how people would be a center stage in there. So those are some of the, uh, some of the actions that we are taking to be able to make sure that even as we are appealing to the creditors to relook at some of the moral issues like Tim has mentioned, it is important for them to recognize that any citizen that is in, that is in distress is actually distress for, all, for most people. So any kind of country or people that are in a kind of a situation where it is unbearable, like we are right now as a country, then it means that the issues for campaigning for debt cancellation becomes a fight for everyone, including the creditors themselves. Because it is important that creditors, even as they are looking at you know, making profit, the issue of uh, re-looking really at the quality of life of people where those credits are going 
It's very, very important to safeguard that. Because if people become discontent and they are held in a situation of distress for a long time, there will be no other means of raising resources, even for the country to pay back the debt. And that is why we are saying the interest payments that are continuing right now to be paid by government are crowding out our budget as a country. And you'll find that expenditure on social and economic development programs is actually suffering. And in the end, people continue to pay the price. Should we really continue seeing people paying the price when, when the lenders themselves can actually do Zambia you know, justice by re-looking at some of the you know, agreements and contracts that they were signing, especially that they were being signed with the previous regime that really took advantage of the citizen without having a recourse to where the country was going. So I think it's on this moral question that we are making this strongest appeal that the youth and women of Zambia need justice. The women and youth of Zambia require a kind of morality, you know, by the lenders to consider their right to life by ensuring that the economic uh, fundamentals and the economic uh, growth that the new government is actually taking on needs to be supported. So the support from the lenders is not just to cancel debt, but their cancelling of debt will also put Zambia back on its trajectory of ensuring that we can now begin to look at inclusive economic development and opportunities for people, especially for the youth and women of this country. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I have a, I'm going to ask Tim this question, but, but you're welcome to also answer it, um, Ngwazi. You've just been talking about uh, the, uh, the previous government, the current government, but referring to the previous government, um, this is a question which has come in, Tim, which I'd, I'd, like, I'd like you to have a go at. So it's um, given that President Lungu's government, the previous government from prior to August of last year, Given that that government incurred a debt of $12 billion, most of which has been pilfered, could this debt be described in international law as odious debt because it was used to benefit individuals and not the community? And if so, what can we in the international community do about it? So you can try that question. If not, I think wise you can try it, and if not, I can try it, but you get, you get first go. Um, I'll leave it to Nguazi to comment on um, how much she um, thinks the debt could be described as odious um, or not. The debts that Zambia owes to private creditors are governed by English law. And this is true of um, many, um, so virtually all international debts are governed either by English law or by New York law and of the countries that are eligible for this G20 um, debt relief scheme, 90% of their um, debts are governed by English law. What that means is if a government does want to challenge the legality of the debt, or if a government stops paying and a creditor wants to sue that government, that case comes to the High Court in London and is heard under English law. So um, the, whether or not the so there is a legal doctrine out there of um whether debts potentially being odious it's hardly ever been um tried or used as a defense so it's hard to know whether that could work as a defense in english courts if um, the zambian government said we don't owe this debt because we think it is odious um but um the key part of the question for me is what can we in the international community do about it? Actually, I mean, I know we've probably got people here tonight from um, various countries, but I know a lot of you are from the UK. The UK is um, like the most important country, um, bizarrely, in the world when it comes to the um, legal situation with um, government debt. And so getting the law changed in the UK is um, a vital thing that we could do and why campaigning in, on debt in the UK is so important globally. And so there are various changes that we um, um, would like to see to make um, debt restructuring easier, to make it um, that you um, there are ways in which debts would become um, odious or illegal in some way. For example, that if the loans are not publicly um, disclosed when the loans are given, then you wouldn't be able to demand repayment on them. So um, that's some of the um, 
that kind of that's the legal side of it but obviously the odiousness is also about a moral concept of um mm. morally um should these um should lenders be paid these debts should lenders make a profit out of um, these debts and there's so much on the lender side about the high interest rates they've lent at how cheaply they've bought these debts that just for me makes it a um, clear moral um, case that um, there needs to be um, huge um, cancellation of the debts but I'll um, pass to Nguazi to comment on um, what you think about the odiousness of the loans in the first yeah. place. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the things I must state is that I'm not um, an expert when it comes to international law, so I will try to avoid using words that um, may may mean something else. You know, when 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 they are being interpreted at law, but like Tim has said, we are approaching the debt crisis from a moral perspective, in that it would really be immoral for one to make a huge profit out of a crisis, a crisis that impacts on majority ordinary citizens. And I think this is where we are coming from to say, yes, the previous government before August uh, uh, last year, there were quite a lot of um, um, gaps. There were quite a lot of um, uh, uh, you know, discontent in terms of uh, public financial management systems that were appertaining, because I mentioned earlier on to say the Auditor General's reports kept on revealing, you know, most of the misapplications and misappropriation within the public sector. And we found that the government was not coming up decisively, you know, to deal with those. And clearly, there was a lot of money in a few hands. And those few hands were people that were directly related or directly aligned to the government at the time. So we are coming from that structural kind of uh, challenged perspective. And on one hand, we had lenders that continued to charge interest rates, that continue to even lend some more date you know to the country despite what was coming out in the public in the public realm through the you know such reports at the auditor general's reports and this is where we are premising our call for debt cancellation to say it would really be um, um a, a, a kind of um service to the zambian to the many zambians um out there that are going through turmoil as a result of the debt crisis. They are going through turmoil as a result of the COVID-19, which came, which I mean, came in already when the country was in a debt crisis. And I think it's from this perspective where we are saying there is a people in distress and therefore it would be immoral to see any lender wanting to make super profits on, on, on citizens that are really in a dire straits. Because most of our productive sector and manufacturing sector is yet to rebound from the COVID-19 you know, pandemic. Most of our manufacturing sector is yet to rebound because of the kind of investment that we saw by the previous regime who were really looking at infrastructure. And we know that many of the infrastructure projects were actually coming in at a very high price. You know, some, most of them, based on what information was in the public domain, most of them were costing three times you know, three times the, the normal cost of the particular infrastructure that was being developed, for example. So it is from this perspective that we are saying any of the lenders and we are appealing to BlackRock this time that it would really uh, be to their conscience to ensure that Zambia's debt is cancelled and for them to get back on the table with, this, with the government that is willing to discuss, that is willing to engage, you know, to see how Zambia can be helped, you know, to come back on board economically. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, both of you, uh, for dealing with that tricky question. So, Nguazi has been talking about the, the importance of making the moral case to, to private lenders, Tim. Uh, but someone has asked, uh, are there any historical precedents for private creditors to actually cancel debt? So if you could take that one, please. And um, please um, put your other questions into the chat and we'll, we're now in the Q&A section in case you hadn't noticed. Um, 
Yes, um, there are um, lots of historical precedents to private lenders cancelling debts. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, the good news, the, often the main reason is um, because they agree to cancel some of the debt in return for getting paid some of the rest of it, and they think that's the best deal that they can get. And so one of the um, spurs to them doing that is if a country just stops paying. And actually, Zambia has stopped paying these private creditors. So they're already done that. They're in these negotiations. Kind of, We're there to help support them and push for as much um, cancellation as possible. We've, um, together with the Zambian Civil Society Debt Alliance, calculated some figures that um, for the International Monetary Fund to say the debt is sustainable again, two thirds of the debt to the private creditors and all the interest would need to be cancelled. So that's the kind of scale of um, cancellation we think is needed. And um, a historical precedent for that is Argentina in um, the early 2000s stopped paying the debt, defaulted, and then a few years later got a deal which cancelled 66% of the debt and uh, most of their private creditors agreed to that. There were some who didn't and then spent many years suing um, Argentina. Um, we hope that wouldn't happen. If it did in Zambia's case, then as I said before, those cases um, would come um, to the high court in London. I've just um, remembered one other um, precedent, um, uh, which was relatively small, but um, I think it was about 2003. Um, for those in the UK, the parent company of the supermarket Iceland um, had some historic debt owed by Guyana in South America. And we found out uh, then that they, um, they were suddenly pushing for that debt to be paid and were going to launch a court case. And so Jubilee Debt Campaign and then World, the World Development Movement, now Global Justice Now, went and did some protests outside some Iceland supermarkets and they agreed to cancel the debt. So that's historical precedent of us um, just going and directly campaigning to a private company and then cancelling. Uh, here in Zambia's case, it's a situation where we have the government and BlackRock and the private creditors are negotiating where going to join doing this campaign to strengthen their hands to push for this cancellation to make um, that moral um, argument. Okay, thank you so much. So we don't need to go outside um, branches of Iceland. We need to go outside branches of BlackRock, I think, I think that's what you're indicating. Um, can I just, uh, this, is, this was in the chat, um, Nguazi, uh, there was a, a um, comment from uh, Precious, um, and I just wanted to hear if, if you had anything to say back, just because of the format we have, um, it, it's only us who, who can speak for now, but this, what Precious was saying, as a youth movement in Zambia, we're planning a climate debt dialogue. Let's get in touch. Uh, that's Precious, who's from Fridays for Future Zambia. And I just wanted to ask Ngwazi if you could maybe talk about the links between debt justice and climate justice. And if you have a response to, to Precious, then go for it as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Precious. Um, indeed, any movement that links debt to various other sectors is, is, is something that would definitely bring people on, on board. Because like I said, uh, Civil Society Data Alliance, we are a broad-based um, alliance and we are looking at a date from the different sectors. So of course, Precious is talking about a youth movement that will begin to talk about date and, um, and, and climate justice. We know for sure that um, by and large, Zambia is, um, is endowed with um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, natural resource uh, natural resources and uh, the people that interact more with the environment are definitely youth and uh, women when we talk about agriculture and we know that the implication on um, um, livelihoods when it comes to agriculture as a result of climate change is more felt you know by the women and youth that are found in those sectors so indeed a movement that will begin you know to to take the narrative of uh, climate justice in the in the wake of um, you know the debt crisis is, is is one that will be able to you know to to help 
in mobilizing, especially the youth out there, because they are a critical voice. They were able to show what they are able to do with the power of the vote. And um, if we bring them together, you know, around the issues of climate just, justice, but also linking them, you know, to Zambia's debt, we will begin to, you know, to, uh, you know, to put life to what we mean by debt crisis, to, to what we mean by the implication of debt on Zambia, you know, to such an important uh, discourse as climate, uh, as climate change. So I think that is a very welcome one. And um, I know that um, Precious probably has our details. We can get in touch so that you become part and parcel of the Civil Society Data Alliance, because we are looking at how we can broaden the, the space and broaden the participation, especially targeting uh, most of the critical sectors. And of course, the, not right now, we know that the issues of uh, climate justice are priority you know, globally, and uh, Zambia is definitely part of the global world. It would be great you know, to begin to bring that discussion on board. Thank you, Precious. Okay, great. Um, this has turned into a networking for Zambian Civil Society, which is exactly why we, why we hosted the event, but also to yeah. the UK Civil Society. Um, so Tim, uh, just, just talking about these, these links between climate justice, debt justice, that was obviously a really key um, subject that came up as the UK uh, hosted the COP26 uh, conference back in November. And that was something that we saw uh, on the streets of Glasgow that, that, that particularly uh, young people were really making the, those links. Coming, bringing this back to BlackRock and to the private creditors, we know that BlackRock is um, a massive investor in oil and gas and in uh, big agribusiness. How, how can we make links between these different movements, climate justice, debt justice, to put pressure on, on a private creditor like Black, BlackRock and in, and in the context of these debt negotiations that are so crucial for Zambia at this time? Thanks, Dario. Um, so the, there are existing campaigns that have targeted BlackRock because of their investments in fossil fuels. And um, we've been talking to them to learn lessons and see if we can build links. Um, BlackRock and their, the head of BlackRock, Larry Fink, um, like to um, present themselves as socially conscious and talk about the importance of tackling climate change. Obviously, the campaigns that show how much they're investing in fossil fuels kind of reveals that for what it is. But that's also one of the arguments we can make is that Zambia, with if it was made to pay all its debt to BlackRock, cannot tackle um, the climate crisis with um, that um, burden. And in fact, the um, climate um, disasters, climate changes tending to increase the debts of countries because there's um, yet another massive injustice within um, climate change that rich countries that have caused the emergency are not giving the grants that are needed um, in loss and damage for um, when um, countries are damaged by climate change and are not giving the grants needed for um, governments to be able to um, adapt to climate change to lessen the impacts. And so it's just a, another vital argument that we need um, to make to BlackRock is that if there is any sense in the words that they've put out there about sustainability and climate change, they have to um, be cancelling Zambia's debt. Um, but also, yeah, we um, need to reach out to um, people in the climate movement and say debt is a vital um, climate issue that um, governments with um, harmful debts are not able to tackle climate change and that we need that finance um, for mm. to get to countries to help deal with the impacts of climate change otherwise the debts are just going to um, carry on increasing. Ngwazi, did you want to add anything to that? Or otherwise we might move back yeah. to vaccines yeah, and just, uh, COVID. Okay, great. Yeah, just to add to what um, uh, Tim has said, one of the um, critical aspects that we have um, experienced um, working in the rural communities is the need for alternative and clean energy sources or because most of the rural communities and even peri-urban communities depend on um, uh, very harmful sources of energy 
And uh, this is also contributing to deforestation, which over time we have witnessed Zambia not being able to undertake a forestation in, 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 in its earnest. So it, we have seen that um, um, most of our forest areas have actually been depleted and most of our communities continue to suffer from using harmful energy sources like charcoal and uh, firewood. So we see that because our government is focused on um, debt repayment with these high interest rates, there is very little R&D or research and development that is being done to invest in clean renewable energy sources. And even with, if, within the urban areas where I live, in most cases, when we have to buy gas, which is LPG, it's quite expensive. And you wonder how ordinary people in communities can actually afford that. So currently the alternative that is there, LPG, is quite on the expensive side and people are not able to afford. And as a result, they keep on getting back to the harmful sources. And the harmful sources of energy is contributing to some of the health implications that we see. So there is quite a lot of um, uh, linkages around climate justice, date, you know, the date crisis, as well as people's well-being. So I think the likes of BlackRock need to look at it beyond just looking at debt. They also need to see how they can be facilitating governments, you know, to invest more into climate justice so that we can safeguard the lives of people within the process of even, you know, seeking their own livelihoods. So I think it's, it's, it's a serious big question on why would BlackRock be looking for super profits when people are in dire straits and there's a crisis, which is going beyond finances. It's also touching on people's lives. So I think that is the most important thing that would want to lay out on the table and make that earnest appeal. Thank you. Okay, uh, fantastic. And, and and what can we do? Uh, some of us are in the UK, some of us are in Zambia, some of us on this call are, are, in, are in other countries. What can we do, particularly between Zambia and the UK, to, re to reinforce each other's work? What, what, is, what is most useful, uh, most kind of powerful in terms of, say, the, the work that you're doing to, to pressure the Zambian government, or in this case, we're talking about private creditors like BlackRock, what can we do jointly to, to reinforce each other's work? Okay, maybe I can come in. Uh, first and foremost, I think to, to be able to, um, to bring together a pertinent information around the debt situation itself, um, have some kind of um, expertise in terms of analyzing the implication of debt um, you know, on people from all sectors, for example, and not just maybe climate justice, we're also looking at health, we're looking at education. So with this particular information, we can be able to come up with a document that would speak to the realities, the practicalities that are affecting people and uh, arrange for meetings with, um, you know, some of the creditors, you know, to be able to engage them on, on some of the options that are available. Um, and then secondly, um, I know that, uh, you know, Jubilee Debt Campaign interacts with quite a lot of other institutions out there, uh, you know, in, internationally from the UK itself, to try and just help the civil society in Zambia with the relevant information that is needed, you know, for us to engage our government here. We are aware that our government is engaging the IMF for a package, but I think there are certain salient issues that we can bring as civil society you know, providing that alternative thinking to government in terms of ensuring that we are part and parcel of what the government program is around the economic recovery. And then thirdly, uh, we, I talked about our role in terms of pushing for legal and policy reform, you know, the kind of, um, you know, illegal environment that would allow people to have a say in what kind of date you know, Zambia should be procuring in, in our name as citizen. So even in that regard, I think interacting and networking with, um, you know, organizations like yourselves and others out there, you know, to be able to see what has worked. I mean, Tim mentioned about, you know, like 
in is it Greece, Iceland? How did they get to the level where they did? So how, what are, who are those champions that we can interact with from these countries to try and just build capacities on the part of civil society in Zambia to be able to drive this agenda from an informed perspective? Thanks. Brilliant, thank you. So um, I'm gonna to turn to you, Tim, now. So um, Ngwazi's talked about things that we can do, we can share information, uh, particularly on um, who the private creditors are in the first place, for example. That's, that's, that's the first step in many ways. Um, we can reinforce Messages. We can, um, we can, uh, we're all part of networks. Um, I just want, I want to ask you, Tim, about the importance of civil society pressure, whether that's in, in Zambia or particularly in the UK, in, in, in terms of actually getting these, these big changes, because as we know, um, in, in this particular case, I mean, you mentioned that the Zambian government uh, actually requested to, uh, to actually stop stop paying debts to several of the private creditors, and they just they just refused. They didn't even take part in that conversation. So it's, it's obviously very difficult to 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 kind of uh, get these private creditors even in a room to even negotiate with them. So it can it can seem impossible at times. But I just wanted to ask you about the the importance of of this of of coordinated civil society pressure and 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 looking back to the to the previous jubilee debt campaigns from about twenty years ago. Could you maybe just summarize um, the kind of role that civil society played. So this was in, uh, you can maybe give some of the stats as well on the amount of debt that was canceled in around kind of 2005, the HIPAA initiative, and maybe you can explain what that is. But, but, just, but just as in those things would not have happened if there hadn't been civil society pressure. Obviously there were other, other factors, but it, it, I, think, I think it's just important to remind us at this time when we're in a way going through this cycle again, that, that if civil society doesn't call for these things, then they're less likely to happen. So could you just, could you just comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you're uh, entirely right um, in that. Um, I actually uh, asked me to say about the, um, yeah, the, the um, older campaign. I mean, yeah, it was a mass pressure through civil society led to a debt cancellation scheme, which then led to $130 billion of debt being cancelled. And um, it, that only happened because um, people did a huge range of different actions from signing petitions to um, writing to um, politicians to going on protests. And it just showed that um, it can work that um, getting our voices heard is the way to get these moral arguments out there. Um, with um, so with um, BlackRock, we um, already as the alliance in the UK, so Jubilee Debt Campaign, CAFOD, Christian Aid, Global Justice Now, Action for Southern Africa, um, Jubilee Scotland, we've got a petition calling on BlackRock to cancel the debt. If you've not already signed that, please do. I think we'll um, put the link in um, the chat. Um, and then next week on Wednesday, um, we've got a day of action um, against um, calling for BlackRock to cancel the debt, where we'll be asking people to take um, actions on social media. I think one of the questions in the chat was around BlackRock's branches. And yes, they only have um, two offices um, in the UK, one in London, one in Edinburgh, but they have a large um, presence uh, on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter. And so on Wednesday next week, we would um, um, love you to take part in um, our campaign where we're going to properly try and um, put it front and centre for them so that they can't um, ignore the issue and that they have to um, move these discussions on Zambia's debt higher up and have the moral case presented to them rather than just seeing it as a financial negotiation that's happening um, in the in in the darkness um in between and we want to um, shed light on it and show what is really happening um with the um, immorality of um demanding um huge profits out of um stamp of lending um at high interest rates great thank you tim and, and and just as you as you've mentioned the petition and um obviously people should should uh, should sign it if they can share it with friends and family and also that's the way that you're about um, the social media 
um, actions that you can do next next Wednesday uh, when they announce their um, quarterly profits. Um, just just to ask you, Tim, maybe a bit more on the logic behind what this petition seeks to achieve, and, and in a way looking looking ahead over the next kind of few months. Uh, yeah, how how it could play out, and and, and why. Well, I'm assuming most people on this call have already signed the petition, but kind of why it's why it's so important to do so. Yeah. So the Zambian government has set an aim to try and um, negotiate, renegotiate the debt by the end of June. Um, and so the first meetings with um, lenders are due to happen this month. So it is really urgent. This is happening right now. Um, it is crucial for um, Zambia. So, like if um, a deal that cancels a substantial amount of the debt, as uh, Zenguazi has said, could then free up um, resources, help um, Zambia recover um, from the pandemic and invest um, going forward. Um, if, on the other hand, they feel pressured into um, agreeing a deal that commits to large debt repayments that could um, have devastating impacts um, on public spending going forward. Um, but then, um, obviously, this is vital for people in Zambia, but also Zambia is one of the first three countries going through um, this um, G20 scheme. And so the better the outcome for Zambia, the better then we can push for outcomes for other countries going through the scheme and also more likely countries are to apply for it if they see that there is some worth um, and that they might get um, some debt cancelled um, rather than um, yeah thinking actually as it is at the moment um, Zambia has um, applied over a year ago and nothing has happened so that's why the next few months are crucial and why this is um, crucial both for people in Zambia but for people in many countries um, that are suffering from um, debt crisis because of um, this high interest lending because of the pandemic now because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine have all had um, um, huge impacts on um, countries' debt situations. Okay, thank you, Tim. We're coming to the end of the of the webinar. Uh, thank you for um, a lot of your questions and comments. Um, I think that we've probably covered a lot of, of of it of those questions with a lot of the answers that that have been given. Um, so, but we can't always cover every single question. I, I wanted to ask um, Nguazi um, about the importance. In a way, you started off talking about why why debt needs to be cancelled uh, in uh, Zambia. Maybe you could uh, just building on what Tim has Tim has just said about. Uh, I mean, he he's been making connections to uh, what will happen in other countries. As we know, uh, many countries in the global south are, are, are taking on more debts, are, are, are kind of edging closer to default, or having to borrow more. Um, we're kind of expecting over the next few years that that, that will happen. Unfortunately, that, that that more countries will will be in a more severe uh, debt crisis for many of the factors that Tim has just mentioned. But coming coming back to to what what it would mean for ordinary people in, in Zambia if private creditors like BlackRock and that's one of the biggest. So if other private creditors also were to uh, be compelled to actually cancel debts alongside. You know, other countries which have lent as well, such as China. What 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 would it mean um, for people in Zambia and and for you for civil society if a substantial amount of Zambia's debt was cancelled? Well, thank you so much, um, Mario. I want to start off with a very interesting comment in the chat box that is um, related to BlackRock, and it says um, this is on their website where it says at BlackRock. We have an opportunity, a responsibility, even to make a positive difference to society. And that is a principle. And this was um, posted by the, 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 the founder, chairman, and CEO of BlackRock. So meaning that this is a principle that uh, BlackRock was founded on to make a difference in society. And definitely with the high interest rates that are applying to Zambia, to Zambia's loan, they are, they are of course in contradiction with this principle. And this principle is posted on their website, which is in the public domain. So it simply means for us, we are simply holding them to this principle. 
because for them to cancel the bulk of Zambia's debt, first and foremost, the many children that are not able to access secondary education, you know, when they are done with their primary education, they will be given an opportunity, which is a lifetime opportunity for them to complete their secondary education and become productive citizens. Then secondly, the many girls that are, in the, that are being withdrawn from marriage, which is really a violation of their right, or because their families are not able to economically support them to go to far flung, maybe for example, schools, and they see you know, marriage as an easier option. This is a kind of violation that BlackRock would be you know, bringing to a halt if they canceled Zambia's debt, because then our girls would be given that life-changing opportunity for them to follow their dreams. Then thirdly, any cancellation of debt will allow Zambia's health system you know, to be improved so that the many out there that are not able to access the COVID vaccine, for example, the many out there that are not able to access even the basics you know, in terms of their medical requirement, will be facilitated to live a life once more that is of quality health and that they will be able to be facilitated to be productive citizens that can be able to engage in other economic activities. So really, BlackRock's simple action in line with their own statement on their website of making a difference to society is what we are see, what we are yet to see in Zambia by them taking a step to cancel their debt and allow the majority of Zambians to follow their, their aspirations and be able to attain the potential that they do have. But also, I think lastly, they will be able to accord our new government and hold our new government to account because the government is saying it's committed to its people. It wants to bring people at the center of development. So canceling the debt will allow Zambia to have those extra resources that can be channeled you know, to those very important development projects that are meant to be you know, uh, facilitated on behalf of people through the physical decentralization that has started. So that would be my message and hoping that for once, BlackRock will live up to its uh, principle of being a responsible institution and a, 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 an institution that will provide positivity to society in what they do. Thank you so very much. Thank you uh, so much for, for, the, for those comments. And um, if they're not feeling like, uh, like doing it themselves, then I'm sure with our pressure, we can help them along the way to, to reach that conclusion. Um, so thank you so much uh, to everyone and to our, um, the co-organizers of this webinar. So Jubilee Debt Campaign, CAFOD, uh, Global Justice Now, AXA, um, and Christian Aid, if I just mentioned them again. And um, the, if, if you can please sign the petition or if you haven't already, uh, uh, please, please tell other people to do that. You'll get more information about um, efforts you can do on social media next week, which would be great as, uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, they, they do care about their, about their reputation. So um, that is something that, that we can uh, focus on uh, because we're making a moral case um, for this to happen. And our pressure, as we've seen in the past, um, over the past few decades, it can make a difference. So it is really important for us to do this. We're doing it in a coordinated way. We're joining forces with, with Zambian civil society. So uh, BlackRock and other private creditors uh, we'll be hearing this in uh, multiple countries. So um, I will I will say goodbye. Um, I don't think there are any final comments, but if Tim or Eva have anything important to say, now is the moment to say it. And if not, um, we will finish the webinar. We'll, we will leave the, um, the call on for, for a few more minutes if people want to connect via the chat, and, uh, but we, we will finish there. So, um, Please join me in, in thanking uh, Ngwazi and, and Tim for their time. Thank you.